I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written. Many people are today very concerned about this thing called spiritual formation, and I think with good reason. It's not inappropriate that Christians today are asking some hard questions and looking for answers that, frankly, they deserve. One of the issues with spiritual formation is that if you trace its roots back, it goes back to the spiritual disciplines of Ignatius Loyola. I think it's important that we don't vilify people who may see things differently from us. But I also believe it's important that we ask the questions that need to be asked. And certainly, those of whom the questions are being asked have the responsibility to answer some important questions. And, uh, questions such as, why is this not based on what we have historically taught as a church? Why are these ideas coming to us from theologians who are, in essence, spiritualists? When I hear that, I think to myself, there must be a good answer to that question somewhere. But to be honest with you, I haven't heard anything resembling a good answer to that question yet. Why? Because there isn't one. And I believe there are several good reasons why Seventh-day Adventists are very concerned. We are a people of the book and we're a people of Bible prophecy. And we know some of what's coming down the line in the last days of Earth's history. You see, some of us believe we're this close to the return of Jesus. We are concerned then because we've been told in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that deceptions are going to come, startling deceptions. Now, let me ask you this question. Even if you disagree with what I'm saying, especially if you disagree with what I'm saying, if a Seventh-day Adventist Christian knows that deception is coming, and then a Seventh-day Adventist Christian sees a movement flooding into the church, traces the roots of that movement and say this leads to authors that are Roman Catholic in the orientation or perhaps they are, uh, are spiritualistic in their orientation. These authors promote certain things that we just don't believe. Now, let me ask you, especially if you disagree with me, don't you think it's logical that we'd be concerned? If I'm concerned, you can see why I'm concerned because we're this close to the end of the world and this thing has a a ring about it that causes some questions to be asked. Contemplative prayer and monastic practices and spiritual disciplines that go back in some directions that alarm some of us. The devil said 20, 30 years ago, I'm going to introduce into Christianity new age prayer and meditation techniques. I'm just going to ask a question, not make a claim. The question I'm going to ask is, could we be seeing that in our own church right now? If the answer is no, thank the Lord. If the answer is yes, then what we need to do is flee this and make it our covenant with God to stand on the Bible and the Bible alone as our rule of faith and practice. There can be no revival that uh, unless it is based solidly on the Bible itself. Now, we would say as Seventh-day Adventists that our revival could be based on the Bible and supported very strongly by the spirit of prophecy. I'm very thankful to Aaron and Colette for their work in encouraging all of us to be involved in true revival and true reformation. Would you stand with them? Would you make a covenant with God that your spiritual journey, your spiritual growth will be based on the Bible, supported by the wise counsel we receive in the spirit of prophecy. Would you make that your covenant? We're so close to the end of time. We know that deceptions will abound. We don't want to make accusations about anything or towards anybody. But we do hope and pray that what is promoted as bringing spiritual revival and reformation will be solid and will be biblical and will be Seventh-day Adventist. I encourage you, make your covenant. Join me, join Aaron, join Colette, join the many who wish to see Jesus come soon. He will come after a period of great revival in his church and in the, in, and in the world. And we know that that revival is going to come when we commit to Christ, pray and study, and build our lives and our experience solidly on the Bible as the Word of God. In the time of the golden calf, there was a shaking that took place among God's people. And it always revolved around the ones who wanted to stay true to the Word of God and follow the worship of God the way He had decide, uh, designed, and others that were looking for something else. They were compromising their worship, and they're compromising the Word of Truth with the pagan teachings and practices of the nations around them. 
that same threat faces God's people in the last days where instead of looking vertically to God, we begin to look horizontally and compare ourselves among ourselves with the other religions and begin to integrate and adopt some of the pagan practices of even other Christian churches. It's the, the Babylonian food that Daniel said he would not eat. Some of the people of God are, are now compromising. And you know, we can just see over and over in the word that when this happened, it did not end well. Jesus said, unless we're converted and we become as little children, we can't enter the kingdom of God. The Lord wants us to just love the Bible, teach and preach the Bible in its simplicity. If we want to know how to pray, we don't need to find some kind of spiritualistic formula for that. How did Jesus pray? How did Daniel pray? How did Solomon pray? Their prayers are here. We should be modeling our prayers after what we find in the Word of God. It's really not that complicated, friends. But you'll find as we enter the last days, if we are faithful to the Word of God, and if we are preaching and teaching and living and praying the way that is taught in the Word of God, there's going to be a conflict. It may not be popular in the world. There's going to be a shaking. There's going to be a struggle. You know, we need revival. And revival is going to come when God's people really return to the Lord with all their hearts and they pray and they embrace the original covenant that the Lord made, that new covenant that Jesus sealed with his own blood. And I'd like to appeal to you, friends, to say I want to return to the simplicity of a devotional life based on the word of God, based on praying like Jesus prayed, based on sharing our faith with the world, and invite you to participate in returning to this covenant of God, returning to God's covenant, and join this movement, friends. That's my appeal for you, and that's my prayer. Hello, everyone. My name is Howard Peth, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted that you folks are here with us because we have a very important topic to discuss. It's the topic of contemplative prayer. I was asked last year to write this book, and we've called it The Dangers of Contemplative Prayer. And so we need to talk about this uh, heresy. One man has called it uh, heresy on steroids. It's been present in other elements of uh, the church, the Catholic Church and so forth, for a long time. But now it's coming into Protestant churches, and sad to say, it's even infiltrating to some extent our own Adventist church. If God really intended us to indulge in contemplative prayer, get into the silence with the mantra and mysticism, why didn't he say so? Why didn't he teach it in his word? Now in conclusion, I'd like to read a quote from my book. Now having examined the facts, we can conclude only that spiritual formation with its mystical silence of contemplative prayer in the emerging church is a modern day Trojan horse quietly smuggled into Christianity by the devil himself. And we don't want any part of it. I hope that you will make a commitment, a covenant to join with me and Aaron and Colette and others who are concerned about this menace to Christianity to come out of spiritual formation if you've been involved in it and deceived by it. God wants his people whole and unified. So we pray and we hope that you'll pray, ask the Lord to help you in this important move to go to his word. He wants you to listen to him as he talks to you in the pages of scripture. So let's go back to the Bible and away from these things that draw us away. And God bless you in your decision. I'm Herb Douglas. Do listen to many men and women already telling you how the spiritual formation has come into the world but do you know how often, how quickly came into the Adventist church? I've been preaching, and people before me have been preaching and writing books on the threefold union of Protestants, Catholics, and uh, spiritualism. We didn't know what that really would turn out to be. It seemed too fantastical. Well, let me tell you, friends, we're living in it now. The emerging church is that fulfillment of the threefold union.
My name is Rick Howard. Uh, I'm the author of this book that you see behind me here, The Omega Rebellion. And uh, I'd like to talk about what this book is about, what's happening in our church, the church that we all love, that we've given our lives to. The Omega is the total line of deceptions. She called it a train of deceptions that will go right up from the beginning of our church in 1844 all the way to the end of time, to the close of probation. End of time, she said, there would come another deception that would sweep through the church. She called it the Omega, the spiritual formation being taught out there in the institutes and uh, seminaries of the Protestant churches all come from Rome. I'd like to share with you how this spiritualism part works because we have toyed with spiritualism without knowing it in our church for the last 20 years. The very practices of spiritualism that I learned when I was a Hindu, when I was a spirit medium, when I did automatic writing and things like that, those very things that got me into that trance-like state are being taught as a part of spiritual formation. This is what Lectio Divina is. This is what breath prayers are all about. All right, so when, when any of our people are teaching this to our young people, you know, thinking that, oh, this is just a relaxation exercise, it is far from it. All right, it, these are dangerous spiritualistic practices that anybody who has in, been involved in spiritualism and in the occult they are full aware of what's happening. Right from a, a, a uh, paper, a document that was put together at Vatican II of how to do missionary work, where, it, where they said that it is the main tool, it is their main tool of evangelization to win the whole world back to Roman Catholicism. We are supposed to be the ones preaching to call people out of Rome out of Babylon, come out of her, my people. Why? Because she's become the habitation of devils. And what are we doing? We're going to learn the very teachings of spiritualism and bringing those devils right back into our own church. Some will say today, oh, well, we don't teach contemplative prayer anymore. It's not about just teaching contemplative prayer. It's about going out to their institutions to learn an entire discipline by reading books written by by you know, those authors from Babylon that teach these very things, thinking that we're smart enough to be able to, oh, just take the truth out of it. We're not, okay? Satan has always used the same method with God's people from the beginning of the fall. Let them mingle with the Philistines, right? That's how every time the fall would come about. Get God's people to mingle with the fallen people around them. And that's what is going on right now. We have mingled with them. We have gone to learn their teachings, part of Vatican II, teachings that are meant to win the whole world back to Roman Catholicism. Along those same lines, we have many of our young ministerial students that have gone outside the church to get their advanced degrees, like Fox University, and they have, they have uh, been uh, mentored by Leonard Sweet, who is a self-proclaimed Christian mystic, into spiritualism. I mean, you read his books and you know right off the bat that he's a, he's a practicing spiritualist. And we have pastors, young pastors in our church that have, that have studied under him and now back in our church, it winds up that they are pastoring the largest of our churches in our colleges, some of them, influencing our students. Can you, you think about that for a minute? How did something like that take place? Is it coincidence? Is it coincidence that, that many who trained under Leonard Sweet are now in our colleges or large churches teaching our young people these very things that they've learned out there? There are teachings from Vatican II. Folks, we have to open our eyes to what's happening here. I'm Derek Morris, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share about my journey in spiritual formation and recognizing
aspects of that movement that were not in harmony with the scripture, how God led me, I guess watched over me even in my searching, and then led me to strong convictions that brought me back to scripture, to the authority of God's word in my life. And so I began a journey. I began to read books about spirituality. And as I look back, I realized that in many ways I was careless and lacked wisdom and discernment. I'm so thankful that even through that journey that God was watching over me. As I began to search more deeply, I realized that there were principles under the umbrella of spiritual formation that were not biblical. Take, for example, the issue of prayer. Ellen White speaks about prayer as the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. And yet there were forms of prayer that were being pushed under this umbrella of spiritual formation that weren't a conversation at all. They were using little mantras, uh, very similar to Eastern forms of prayer. Uh, When I began to study more deeply, I recognized Jesus said, don't pray with vain repetitions as the heathen do. And yet there was a time in those uh, years in the mid to late 80s when I was exploring with things like uh, the Jesus prayer, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, there's nothing wrong in the blind man Bartimaeus crying out that prayer. But when they start telling you to repeat that over and over again and not even let any thoughts come into your mind, that just doesn't harmonize with the teaching of Scripture. It doesn't harmonize with the uh, example of Jesus and how he prayed. And praying with an intelligence and speaking about real issues in life. Because I believe that in the Bible and the writings of Ellen White given to this movement, we have all of the counsel needed to help us to grow strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I moved to Southern Adventist University, then called Southern College, in 1987 and, and had that same longing to share with the students on campus Uh, how they could find a personal relationship with God. But unfortunately, I was taking some of the baggage with me from my own journey, reading books like Richard Foster and others, not recognizing that while there were some sound principles in some of the chapters of the books, there were other ideas that were included that were not sound. They were not biblical. And so here I was trying to help others, and yet as I look back, and I have to confess... I had much that God needed to teach me. I'm thankful for his mercy. I'm thankful for his forgiveness. I'm thankful for his grace. God has uh, called me back to the teachings of his word. Now I'm blessed to be the editor of an international journal for pastors called Ministry. And it's so important to me that I give a clear witness to my colleagues in ministry. So whether you're just starting in ministry or you've been in ministry for decades, if you've been challenged by something I've shared today, I I want you to know that I have tried to follow what Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 15, to speak the truth in love. I'm not here to be critical. I'm glad that people were willing to speak the truth to me, (laughs) like my mentor, Jack Blanco, and say, go back to the Bible, Derek. Study what the Bible says. And I believe as we do that, we'll have a sure foundation. And I know that God will bless you as you seek a biblical foundation for a closer relationship with him.